All right, I think we're now live. Hey, everybody, Robin Robbins here, uh, coming to uh, to you live from a very sunny, beautiful Franklin, Tennessee. We got a very special webinar we're doing today. Um, last count, I think we were we were pretty close to, or we may have surpassed six hundred people on the on the webinar registered for the webinar today. So, um, so this is obviously this is a very exciting webinar, very interesting topic. Um, we are going to be talking about how uh, five of my clients generated an average increase in revenue of two point one million dollars last year and an increase in net net profits of six hundred forty six thousand one hundred. $15. And that's in 2020. As you all know, that was a horrendous year for many people, very painful with shutdowns. There was political unrest. There were business closures, uh, tough economy, unemployment through the roof. Um, and, uh, and so for them to grow that much, and that's, again, that's an increase of 2.1 million on average, an increase of $646,000 in net profit after taking fair, a fair market salary. And that's the increase in addition to what they were already doing. So, you know, folks, this really is, when, when, when I say these five people are, are very unique in the industry, I, I, I sincerely mean it. Um, you know, these results are not typical, right? These are not results that most MSPs experienced last year. If you've come to my roadshow events, if you've been following any of my articles or blog posts and whatnot, you know that we had, we as a company saw a 500% increase in businesses, MSPs going out of business. They tended to be the smaller shops. Um, I think they were exclusively the, the smaller shops. Um, so a lot of people, while a lot of them were going out of business, these guys were growing like crazy. So I'm very excited about this. Um, now I'm gonna share my screen before we get started. I just wanna go over just a couple things. Um, again, just in case you didn't catch it verbally, this the average one year increase in from 2019 to 2020 for the five people today was a $2.1 million increase. Actually, it's like $2,133,429, $646,100 in net profits and a $115,000 increase in MRR. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're just joining us right now, what you want to do is you go over to robinsbigseminar.com forward slash BYB. And what you can do is download the essays that these guys wrote. You can see the specifics on their business, uh, what they did, how they did it. They did outline in their essays the campaigns that uh, they used. And today on this webinar, we're going to dig into that a little bit more, a little bit more detail. Um, so um, the other thing I would say, guys, is get your questions ready uh, in the uh, Zoom area down there below, the best way to ask a question is in the Q&A bubble. You can just kind of click on that. That helps us to uh, organize the question. So make sure you go download their essays and start looking at that as we go through this um, and make sure you have plenty of questions lined up. I mean, this is your opportunity to ask a peer of yours how they achieved incredible growth. Now, three important things I want you to know, this webinar is not some blatant sales pitch for Accelerators Club, for boot camp. Um, I'm not selling anything on, on, on this webinar. So I just want to say that because I know a lot of you are going to see, um, and they're going to talk about accelerators and going to rapid implementation and producers club, et cetera. Um, but that's not the purpose of this webinar. I'm not going to just line up like softball questions to say, okay, well, tell everybody why they should join accelerators. I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, we're not selling anything. I really do want this to be of value for all of you. Um, the other thing is, I, you know, I don't want to, I, I just want to be clear. I, I'm not guaranteeing or implying that, hey, sign up for my program, join Accelerators, join Producers Club, and you're going to get these results. Because again, I can't, nobody can legally or ethically, morally guarantee any kind of results. I just want to kind of put that out there as well. Um, and, but, and the other thing I want to say is just don't let these people discourage you because I know when you hear these kind of results, which are real, by the way, they're not fake. These are real results. Um, some of you might get the reaction of, um, well, there, there's probably some hoax going on here, or they probably fiddled with the numbers in some way. Maybe there's like a little bit of sour grapes because maybe you had a terrible year. Um, and, and I would encourage you to kind of Notice that if that's going on, um, like Mark Twain said, one of the most annoying things in the world is a good example. 
And anytime you've got a good example, anytime you've got the, the ideal, um, you can use it for either inspiration or you can say, you know, screw that and, and it can discourage you, make you feel bad about yourself or turn sour grapes. And again, I just would encourage you to, to instead take this as a, 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 the, the point of you can do this too. I mean, if they did this in 2020, you can certainly do it this year. Um, now, real quick, want to go over what the heck is the better your best because again some of you on here are new members of mine maybe you're you're new to me and you're going well what the hell is this byb and all this right so the better your best contest is something we started doing 14 years ago and we did that in conjunction with the big event we have every year um started as a joke we started calling it robin's big seminar actually a lot of the key terms you hear me using these count these come from clients so they talk about robinizing your, my website um, you know, or it, Hey, that's Robin's big seminar. Like that's just, it was a phrase that came out of my clients. That's what they called it. So we just, it stuck. So every year we have a big annual event for all of our clients. They come in, there's roughly usually like last year, obviously it was virtual. We had, we had like 40, 4,800, 4,800 people who attended virtually. Um, usually in person, we have about 1200 to 1400 attendees in person, all MSPs from all over the world. Um, and part of that is what, what we started doing 14 years ago is selecting uh, our top clients um, based on revenue, uh, increase in revenue, in profitability, MRR clients, and of course, in the marketing they were doing and letting them compete on stage to be my spokesperson. And so the audience votes and we have a panel of judges and they share, here's what we did to generate increases in sales, profits, MRR. And the audience loves this because you get an opportunity to see uh, the campaigns, the strategies that my top clients are using, right? So that's what part of Better Your Best is. It's a competition we do every year for spokesperson position. Um, and really it's to fulfill our mission. This is our mission statement as an organization, as a company. And it's to build a community of success-minded entrepreneurs that inspires excellence, encourages collaboration, and expands the capacity of all members to achieve great things. And that encouraging collaboration is a big part of why we do better your best. And the other three reasons why we hold this contest is we wanna encourage our members to implement and report. So there's a, there's a natural law, they call it Pearson's law. And that is when performance is measured, performance improves. When performance is measured and reported back, the rate of improvement accelerates. So that's why we started doing these contests in the first place. We wanted people to implement and we wanted them to report back the results. And that helps us to improve our marketing. It helps to encourage the other members. So that's why we initially started doing this and, and still why we continue to do it. It's also to inspire members to implement because it's one thing to hear something in the toolkit or hear something that I'm teaching at a class um, and you get it. But when you see a peer doing it and getting results, often that's the key that unlocks things. I don't know why that is. It just, it's the way it is. So it is to inspire those of you out there who, who are just getting started. Maybe you're struggling, having a little tough time of it to inspire you to implement more. And it's also to improve the marketing campaigns that we roll out because as more members implement and report back, we learn what's working, what's not working. So if we didn't have this contest where we asked them to formalize an essay and the specific campaigns and the metrics. If we didn't do this, then we would not know as much what works and what doesn't work. So that's that's why uh, we, we do this competition. So these five contestants that are on with us today, the only one I'm standing in for Ross, he's, he, you know, so you have to imagine Ross over my face because he took this at the last um, producers club meeting the picture Ross couldn't be there in person. So, um, but these five are gonna be presenting at our, uh, Robin's big seminar, our big annual event. So if you're coming to that event, you're going to see these people, you're going to meet them, you're going to get the specific campaigns they use because we're going to compile all those campaigns and we're going to put them up on the dashboard and we're going to allow you to download all of them. Um, and then that that's your marketing plan for the year. I mean, think about it. You come in and if you just replicate the campaigns that they did, I don't know if you get 2 million increase, but you're, you know, you're sure to get something if you replicate what they did, because they're going to be sharing with you the campaigns that worked the best. 
Um, so go, if you go to Robin's big seminar, that's where this event is. Uh, all the details of this event are happening. It's in May. Um, we're having Kevin O'Leary as uh, one of our keynote speakers, as well as Marcus Limonis. Uh, I'm going to be delivering a really good brand new session on the six most important marketing bullets you need because we have a Western theme. And uh, then the better your best, and as well as dozens of other breakout sessions. And so this is our big industry event. If you're looking to grow, if you're looking to learn how to make a, be a better business owner, how to add more profitability, how to get better quality clients, this is the place you want to be. And oh, by the way, the winner of the contest gets a car and we're giving them an Aston Martin this year. So they, they literally get an Aston Martin car. And that's mainly because I don't want my spokesperson driving around in a really crappy car. That's just, that's just the reality of it. Okay. So, um, Ryan, let me check in with you real quick. I don't think we have any questions so far, but do you, no, no, the, the, you want to add? No, you're, you're great. Um, the one question that did come in, which I think is relevant is that, um, you know, Alan asked, what's the percentage increase? You talked about the 2.4 million in top line, right? And I did, I did answer him, it's 121%. So the average is literally more than doubling in top line revenue. Um, right. no, no questions about where to get the Aston or anything like that yet, but I'll let you know if that comes up. Right, and guys, again, if you go to robinsbigseminar.com forward slash BYB, you can download their essays and you can see more details of the specific number of revenue up, recurring revenue. And we're going to go over some numbers in this, in this webinar as well. So you'll get, you'll get the picture, but I would encourage you to download those essays. Um, you can do that um, toot sweet and, you know, we can be on with this. All right. So again, if you have questions, let me know. Now we're going to dive right in and we're going to get started. Um, the first uh, person that I'm going to interview, the first contestant in the Better Your Best competition this year is Mike Bazaar. Uh, Bizarre Solutions, and he's an MSP based in Lubbock, Texas, and he founded the company in 2009. He's got 12 employees, and in 2020, it was at 2.76 million. So, Mike, now's the time to unmute, brother. Yeah, sorry, I'm, uh, yeah, so, yeah, we, um, I guess, diving in here, um, yeah, was, like I said, we started the company in 2009, um, we're actually up to 14 employees. Um, which is great. And I think, you know, we started it the way a lot of people start their IT firms, right? We can do IT better. Um, you could maybe do it better than your boss or wherever it was. I'd spent a couple of years working with Fortune 500 companies and thought I could bring, you know, this really great IT experience to small business. And, um, and so that's really how we, we started, the, you know, the company. And, and like I said, we're, we're there in Lubbock and, and uh, which is about 250 to 280,000 people. And I always feel like that's relevant because, I know I've sat in the audience before and thought, yeah, but they've, they're in a big city. They got millions of people. Of course, they can get those kind of increases in results. And, and last year, I think ours was 52% increase in revenue. Yeah. Um, so we was, we, I, I was look at, I was going to say, I wanted to make sure you, you said that because you had a 52% growth from 2019 to 2020, um, yeah. which is just crazy good. You know, I mean, that's it, you know, it's, and actually, you know, the other thing that I, sh I wanted to mention is from 2017, which is, I think, when you became a client, yep. you had a 95% growth from there. Yeah. Yeah. So, nice? yeah. So we, yes, yeah, so 2017 is when we came to boot camp and finally signed up. I'd been to a couple of boot camps and I think, you know, my essay talks about some of the stuff and so go read, you know, everybody go read it, but it is, you know, the, the joke in producers club is everybody buys the toolkit and they stick it on the shelf and then they let it get dusty and dirty. And then they finally get desperate enough for whatever it is and they pull it off and they do the stuff. And so, you know, that's kind of the whole theme on everything it is, is you've got to do the work and, you know, everybody always asks the, you know, what's the one thing. I mean, I don't know how many times I've been with an earshot of you, Robin, and somebody walks up and says, Hey, what's the one campaign I'm really struck. What's the one thing. And, and, you know, my reply now is always, well, you gotta do the work and you just got to pick, right. It doesn't really necessarily, I mean, there's a ton of great information, but if you don't do the work and don't do the right work, you won't get the right results. And, you know, and I'm not saying, cause everybody works hard as a business owner and, you know, but they're stuck in their technical work a lot of the time and they don't step back and say, let me do the sales and marketing work correctly. So they send out one aspirin campaign. They don't do any follow-up phone calls or emails and they go, that didn't work and they quit. And, and then they go, this, this stuff doesn't work. And, you know, I've heard a lot of that, even, you know, talking to other people I know that have been in producers club and it's, you know, well, I didn't get that many leads from this campaign or that mailing campaign. I'm getting them all from my website. 
And so I've been asking them, well, how many can you qualify and came to your website because of those campaigns? And they're like, well, we don't, we don't know exactly. And I said, well, it's a hard number to get because a customer may not tell you exactly why they Googled you or whatever the case was, but it's, it's all of these things dovetail in together. And, and that to me makes the, the big difference is that you have to do, again, you have, you have to do the work and, and keep pushing on it and to get the results. Yeah. I mean, that one thing question gets asked a lot of ways, you know, it's sometimes it is just what's the one thing. Sometimes it's what's the one campaign I should start with or, you know, Robin, if you had to start over again, like what would be the first thing you would do? Um, you know, so it gets asked a lot of different ways. And I under, look, I understand it because when you're, when you're faced with this overwhelming amount of like you look at our marketing roadmap in the toolkit, right? And you look at that and you go, oh my God, this is, you know, crazy. But, you know, you, that's why we tell you to follow the roadmap and start implementing and roll things out. And I think, you know, a lot of people, like if they get one or two leads, see, they shouldn't be discouraged about that. Like the fact that you got a couple of leads is like, keep doing and improve. Like, okay, what could you do better? Maybe tighten up the list, maybe get better at the follow-up calls. Maybe, um, you know, I don't know, whatever. You, you, you tweak this, the campaign and, um, and you just keep going and getting better and better. But most people, they stop. And so then they have to start over. It's like, well, if you don't like starting over, then stop quitting because you keep quitting and then you have to keep starting over and you got to go through this painful process of starting over. Um, so, but, but let me, let me share everybody with your results. So, cause I want to, I want to, we got a little picture of you, but um, so in 2020, you got your revenues up $951,166. MRR was up 33,000 net profit went up 208%. So I think we already established that you did quite a bit of marketing. I'm looking at your essay here, but what would you say, looking back, what would you say are like the one, two, three things that you did that made the, had the greatest impact in getting those results? Yeah. So a couple of things. So the kind of bigger picture, you know, in the essay, I talk about um, Jim Collins and, you know, good to great and all those books he's written. One of the things he hits on is the flywheel. And so I go back to, you know, I remember seeing Charles Henson's slide with that calendar that he had the year that he won. That was like, we did 18 million marketing campaigns and thinking, I could never get there, you know, like that was overwhelming. And to me, it's that flywheel is, is a key to a lot of the success and it goes back to do the work, do, do a little work and then do a little more work and do a little more work and do a little more. And as you do that, you get pushed in that flywheel and you gain significantly more momentum so that you can see those results come up and then they just start keep cranking out and, and you get, you know, really great results coming back out of it. Um, so kind of a quick overview of, of you know, what we did was, um, you know, we, because of COVID, I mean, a little bit on that, right? Beginning of the year started out, we were doing aspirin campaign and Google ads and, you know, SEO on the website and like Google local, we do, you know, try to post up on our Google local page, um, you know, once a, every week or two, you know, we were basically trying to do all the things as much as we possibly could. Um, April, May, and June, we didn't get a lot of leads um, because it was April, May, and June of COVID and everybody was shut down trying to figure out what was going on. Um, right. We still closed 7K in MRR because we never stopped. So because we didn't get the leads and we followed up with customers and we, we talked about VoIP and we pivoted and changed to what helps people now wasn't what are we going to go sell? It was, what are we going to, you know, so yeah, we're going to sell and VoIP, but it's because they need to work from home. We're, we went out and we found and kind of built this, we'll do cybersecurity for your home users. Um, and we were very clear, like, I'm not going to troubleshoot your crappy router at your house. Um, if your internet sucks, we'll, you know, recommend a replacement or an upgrade, but you know, how can we do that at a reasonable expense? So as people are pushing everybody to home, we can stretch the security umbrella. We talked a lot about all those things. Um, we kept tabs on inventory. I'm sure everybody ran into the inventory problem. So we had a lot of schools and other customers looking for laptops. And then you'd go, well, here's, you know, the crazy expensive ones, or there's none to be had. And anytime there's in inventory, we'd call the ones we knew were most likely to buy and say, Hey, we've got, but you need to buy now. We're not trying to sell you hard. We're just, if you're not, I got 10 other people I'm calling because somebody wants them. Right. And so we went, went down the list and, and did that. We never stopped Google ads. Um, we, we slowed down on the aspirin campaign for a little bit. Um, we looked for cost savings inside of our business, but honestly, we do that a lot. And so there wasn't a whole lot to trim. Um, 
And then we, you know, kind of towards the end of the year as it started recovering, we started right sizing some customers and looking at some clients because we had been growing. We looked at some clients that we were not profitable on and said, here's your new monthly rate. Um, not necessarily take it or leave it, but we just went back and figured out who was, who was burning our engines we didn't need um, necessarily, or they were just sucking up tons of time, which made it so we couldn't focus as well on some of the other customers and right size out some people. And we really only lost one and it's because they viewed technology as a hammer, right? It was, it was a tool. It wasn't really part of their business. They didn't, you know, it was, I need a hammer to pound a nail and technology was that hammer. And so we went back and almost doubled their rates and talk to them about it. Um, but even then we couldn't get a meeting to say, Hey, you guys have almost doubled in size. We want to talk to you. So we finally just said, Hey, we're ramping your rates over three months. This is what it is. Cause obviously you don't value it. And they, they stuck around for about four or five months and switched to somebody who was half the price and half the service. And, you know, we, nobody likes to lose a customer, but that was, you know, you're going to move on. So um, how many customers, how many customers did you, did you like phase out then in 2020? So we, we lost one. Um, they actually quit us in 2021, but we raised the rates in 2020. Um, and so, you know, for the last three months or so of 2020. Um, and then we had a couple oil field clients that we cut their rates, um, but they're still clients and we've raised them back up. And then we had one other client that left um, kind of right in the middle of COVID and they were like 800 bucks a month and it took three months to get them to pay a bill. And so when they said they found somebody cheaper, we just said, see you later. You were yeah. probably going to get fired this year. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I mean, and the reason I want to say that is because, you know, even like when you stick to your guns and you raise your prices and you, and you don't allow clients to take advantage of you, you know, you, you get what you tolerate. I've said that about employees, but it's the same with clients, you know, um, you get what you tolerate. So, you know, you were able to increase those revenues and profitability and everything, despite, you know, getting rid of a couple of those, uh, those bad clients. So that that's phenomenal. Um, so yeah, so Google ads, SEO, local, Google local, the web forms, the aspirin campaigns, the QBRs, the, all of those things, these are all different campaigns. You have your news, your newsletter, um, you kept sending tech tip emails out all of it. So, um, you know, guys, just again, I want to remind you when, when you come to boot camp, we're going to make sure that you get your hands on these campaigns. Um, let me ask you this. So looking back, let's say 2020, but even I think before then, because personally, I think 2020 revealed whether you, you had a good business model or not 2020 revealed whether you were prepared or not. Right. I mean, it, I don't think, I think people like think there was like, you pulled off this heroic act or, so, you know, even my business, the fact that we grew, even it was a little bit, we still grew when a lot of other event companies were closing and furloughing and their employees and everything else. And I think what happens is in 2020 revealed the strength and were you doing the right things, right? So when you look back, what do you think you learned from 2020 that you would advise someone who may have been in, like, if you could go back to someone who was in your situation in 2017, where, you know, you're struggling, you're not making a lot of money, you're working a lot of hours, um, you know, you have no marketing in place, you know, it's like you're overwhelmed. What advice would you, would you give to those watching? Yeah. So um, real quick too, just cause I know you want to touch on some of the three best campaigns that say we ran last year was just online stuff, SEO, AdWords, everything else, aspirin campaign and referrals. Those by far generated us the most leads. And, you know, like I say, we'll detail all that out in boot camp. Um, but um, yeah, the biggest lessons for 2020 and really years past, there's, there's a couple of things I feel like I've learned, but the, the, well, there's a lot I've learned, but the biggest thing I feel like that pushes into it is one, there's no shortcuts and you have to do the work. Um, there's just no way around it. And, and people that want to run one or a couple and hope they get results, they're never going to grow. I mean, yeah, you'll grow, but you'll never grow well and you'll never have the things. And what hit me was, I was sitting in one of the producer club meetings and you talked about oil wells and it was, you know, you, it wasn't new terminology, but you basically said, if you lost a customer today, which one can you turn up and replace that work? And you have to know those numbers. And I thought, I don't have any of those. Like, I don't know what I could just go do more of, right? I'm going to double the aspirin campaign. I'm going to put more money into Google ads and, and it'll take me, you know, X months approximately to probably get that back, right? I mean, it's all probabilities, but I just didn't know those numbers well enough. And so creating those processes that you can do that 
significantly helps. The other thing that I have learned over the years is um, high growth is controlled chaos. And I know you've even said stuff like this before as well as- Embrace and, chaos, embrace the suck. Yep. It is. And, and I'm not talking, you know, like chaos, like you should have a, a well-documented support process. People should get serviced a certain way. It, it's not necessarily that, but it's, there've been two or three or four times I can look back and, and over the last two years, we've really just been growing crazy. But even a couple others where we got a huge client or a couple of really big clients in a short period of time and human nature and what I did was stop, right? I, I circled the wagons. I wanted to, you know, get control of everything again a little bit. And then you're starting over again, um, like you said in the beginning of this call. And, and starting over takes so much time. Your, your flywheel stops, your momentum's gone, and now you have to rebuild it all back up again. And, and it takes so much time. And so as much as you can stabilize things and provide good quality service, you have to embrace the suck and you have to live in the controlled chaos and, and truthfully push the gas harder. Right. And when, you know, when you feel like, again, and I'm not talking about business fundamentals are bad and I'm not making money, but when you feel like I need to stop just so I can get hold on better, stomp on the gas and find a different way to hold on, you know, grip with your thighs or whatever it is you need to do, but right. you can't jump off that horse. You got to keep going. And that will make it so that you'll be the person that can be up on stage or whatever, talking about how you grew 50% in the middle of COVID or whatever the case was. And again, I, you know, I, all the stuff that we did was piece by piece. It wasn't one magic campaign. It wasn't one thing we did. It wasn't acquisition. It, it was, we did a lot of work and, you know, kept staying in the trenches and, and just, you know, looked for opportunity and kept doing work. Um, the other thing we've done recently that I think has been really cool is um, Vern Harnish came, I don't know when he was here, six months ago or so, um, when he was at Producers Club and he talked about, um, uh, oh, Paul Akers and Fast Cap and, and Banish Sloppiness. I read that book and then I read his other one, Two Second Lean. And it's basically just about constant process improvement. But one of the things we've done that has been really cool through the end of 2020 and into 2021 is we just created a Teams channel that's everybody's daily focus. And so they say everybody on the team by 8.15 in the morning puts what their focus of the day is, what they're stuck on if they are, and what's one way they can save two seconds. And so maybe that's creating documentation. Maybe that's automating a process. Maybe that's turning off a ticket that we just ignore anyways. Um, there's all the, and so it's amazing seeing everybody find all these different ways to increase efficiency. Um, and then we've also moved our project needle pretty far because everybody's that daily focus out loud of saying, here's my priority today helps align everybody into that. And, um, and those things have been really, really super helpful. Awesome. Okay. Well, for time, what, here's what I want you to do. There's questions coming in. Um, and just so we don't make this a three hour marathon, um, Mike, if you could address, you know, you can see the questions, I think, if you can just type the questions to these people, um, mm -hmm. just so everybody knows. But what I think I'll do is I'll take all these questions that are coming in. I'll take what answer you write and respond. And maybe I'll do some additional videos or I'll write it in a blog post or something. Cause there's, there's tons of questions coming in and like what percentage of your campaigns are automated and, you know, what was your marketing budget and, um, you know, just, just all kinds of questions. So guys keep posting those questions, Mike, if you don't mind hanging on, just answer those questions that are relevant, you know, to you. Cause some of them are just more generic and I invite all of you, the contestants to do that. Um, so Ryan, if you could just kind of, you know, help moderate that on the background. All right. So I'm going to keep moving on. Thank you, Mike. That was great. Um, and we're going to move on to Ross Browse Continuous Networks. He's based in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Um, founded the company in 1997. He's got 21 employees. And at the end of 20, uh, 2020, he was at 4.7 million. Uh, Ross, hey. hey. Hey, brother. How's it going? <laughs> All right. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. All right. And um, so... Tell me, you know, unpack this a little, tell, tell us a little bit more about your company, just so people get a feel for, for, you know, maybe your target market, how many locations, whatever you want to fill in the blanks with. Yeah, sure. So we actually weren't an MSP when we started, we were a web hosting company and I didn't actually find, found the original company. That was my business partner. I used to be his employee uh -huh. and then I quit my job, went out and started my own web hosting company and then came back and merged that company with his company. Okay. So it was kind of a uh, roundabout free-for-all way of getting to this point today. Uh, but we became an MSP after uh, Hurricane Sandy when we had our own data center and people were coming to us going, I need to get out of my office. I can't stand this. I'm flooded. I have no power. Uh, so it was like a disaster scenario that really got us started. 
I, I guess a real interesting thing about us today uh, that I can share is about, I guess, six months before the lockdown, we went completely remote. And to this day, we still don't operate out of an office. We all work from home and, and we're. So when the lockdown happened in COVID, we we're just like, okay. It was just another day. <laughs> Let's just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, let me go over your results real quick. So in 2020, you got your revenues up over 1.2 million, MRR up 156,000, which is phenomenal. Net profits up 1.2 million, just insane. Um, so, you know, I think, I, you know, when people, let me ask you this, because when people see these kinds of growth numbers, I think they, they, they don't get excited. They get, they get a little like panicked and they get, they feel tired. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh my God. Cause you know, you, I think a lot of people that are watching that they're, they're, they're doing the work. And yeah. so when they see that they go, oh my God. Right. So, um, I don't know. I mean, like talk about that a little bit. Did this come from existing customers, new customers, a combination? I mean, everything it was uh, going back to something you said before about that feeling where people are thinking, well, you know, how do, how do I do this? I had a really bad year. We had a lot of really bad years, 2017, 2018, even 2019, they were bad. And, and I remember going and meeting with my accountability group every week and I'd be posting my numbers in there and they'd look at me and they say, Ross, what the hell are you doing? Like <laughs> you don't have any sales appointments or you've got sales appointments and you're not closing any deals. Like what's going on here? And I said, well, listen, we're making improvements across our entire business. We're changing our financial uh, perspective in all of our disciplines. We're changing our operations. We're changing our sales and marketing. We're making a ton of investment into all of these processes that are behind the scenes. And I believe that when that all comes to fruition, we're going to get results. Mm -hmm. And Here they we are. Here we are. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Here so we are. So. What, so what campaigns did you implement to get this kind of growth? So, you know, we've run a lot of the ca uh, campaigns. We've been in Producers Club since uh, spring of 2015. So we've ran Bad Date campaign. We've ran Aspirin campaign. We've ran um, Closer Look campaign. We've done a lot of these. But in 2018, you introduced something to us called the Marketing Success Scorecard and challenged us to go out and create one of our own. And I did that. And I really loved it. I just completely fell in love with it. And so what I started to create, it, rather than sending out tons of campaigns, was just one campaign that I would focus on. And everything that I did led to this funnel, which was, was that campaign. So we call it today Continuous Cyber Score. And we use it with our clients. We use it with our prospects. We even use it internally as a way to manage to best practices and standards. So as we go through the operations team, the technical team, as they're working, they use that same process to get better results from clients. So we've just made that an entire under, you know, underpin foundation of everything that we do. Right. And, and just so those of you watching, because this is something I've talked to producers club members about, but a lot of clients aren't, aren't familiar with this. So just give me like 30 seconds to unpack it. And that is we have, you know, we use our, uh, we use the marketing roadmap, but we also have a client success scorecard. And it was one of the best things that we did, t technology marketing toolkit we did, because what it helped our clients to do is to, after they became a client, to grade themselves on the marketing. How well are you doing? What are the gaps? Where are you weak? Where do you need to, uh, you know, where you need to connect the dots? And we use that in a sales process and it worked phenomenally well because it, it's a very natural process. It doesn't feel like you're selling. It feels like we're reviewing your marketing plan. And in your case, we're reviewing your cybersecurity sort of, um, what would you call it? Just approach or, you know, your protections and we're scoring you. And when, when you do that, you, so one thing it puts you, just you having that puts you in an authoritative position because you're saying, right. here's what a good cybersecurity, what complete cybersecurity um, protection looks like or approach. I don't know, however you want to say it. Um, right. And these are the areas that, that you need to be protected. And this is where what good is. See, a lot of times you're selling the clients, they don't know what good is. And right. so you've got to teach them what good is. 
and you got to sell them on that because then when you sell them the improvement, it makes sense. Because if you just go in and you say, Hey, you need ABC, XYZ, you need all these things. A lot of times they're going, do I really need that? I don't even know what that is. And so the scorecard really allows you to have a process for helping a customer understand what good is, what they need, where they're weak. And so that, and that's where the scorecard idea, but Ross, you really took this and and, and made it your own and really enhanced this. So this is now your sales process, correct? Yeah, it's our entire sales process. Everything we're doing around marketing is just getting people into that funnel. And you're exactly right. The impact that it had on me when I did that, when I looked at my low score, I think it was a 43 out of 110 when I first did it. And I went, wow, I really suck. Like, I just am not doing so many of these things. And the problem with people buying managed services, IT services, is they don't know what good is. No. They have no idea. You can say, hey, uh, is everything working fine? And they say, yeah, there's no problems. So it must all be okay. I'm spending enough money. I got the right people in place. And I say, well, what if I told you that wasn't the case? What would you say? And I make them grade themselves. Mm -hmm. So they guess at what score they're going to have before they take it. We go through the process and do it. And then I say, well, it isn't quite what you thought. What, how are you feeling now that you've seen that? And inevitably they all feel let down by their own decision-making processes. Mm -hmm. And so I say, okay, well, you know, let's start figuring out how we can go about improving this. How can we help you? We call it our uh, disciplines of technology health. So that's really what they're assessing themselves on is their overall technology health. And it's not just cybersecurity, it's efficiency, it's backup and disaster recovery. Uh, it's a whole different mindset that they're now thinking about uh, the way they treat technology and it's gotta change. Right, and so when, are you, you're taking this to existing clients as well as new prospects, is that oh, right? Yeah. Yep, okay. absolutely. Yep. Are you using this in your QBRs? I'm using it in my QBRs, uh, everything. I mean, we even when we sit down and talk uh, in the operations team, we have discussions about where we are in certain areas. Every single client has their own scorecard and we're assessing that every three months. And we use that to generate project and hardware revenue. So wh where are you missing? Where are the gaps? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about how it impacts your business. You guys said you wanted to increase your profit this year, but we're seeing massive efficiency problems here in this one specific area. What if we did this? Here's a project that would solve that problem. And they go, mm -hmm. okay, that's great. And they check off and we do the project and it's done. Yeah, it's a very natural consultative sales process. It, it feels like uh, when, when you're using a scorecard approach like that, um, it's just like you go into the doctor. It's like people are used to being assessed. And I think most right. salespeople, this is a lesson for all of you watching this. I think so too many salespeople jump to selling before they diagnose. So they jump yep. to the prescription without any kind of assessment. And I think that's a mistake because the prospect needs to feel as though you are not just selling them uh, some skew item off a shelf. Like, oh yeah, here, you know, I got, here's the thing I got, I'm going to sell it to you. But if they feel like it's more diagnosed, diagnostic and customized to them, then they, you know, instantly they're more willing to buy into it and everything else. So that, that's a really smart thing. And you've got, so, but you've done more than just, so that's a big one, but you, what else are you doing for marketing? You have a, you have an appointment setter now, you have a marketing team, I believe. Yeah. So we're doing a lot of things. Uh, we've got an appointment setter. We've had one for quite a while. Uh, I'm getting ready to hire another one just because we're not keeping up with the, the amount of load right at the moment that's okay. coming in. Okay. Uh, very focused on digital marketing. So LinkedIn ads, Facebook ads, uh, a lot of video creation. I've, I've actually, this needs to be me because I'm building myself up as the authoritative figure here talking about not just things in technology, but things in business. How can you improve your business efficiency? How do you teach your employees better time management? And so beginning to create a lot of that awareness I built a whole video studio in my basement just to record these videos. And so now with the free time that I have, I go down there and I record, write these scripts and record them and just release them. Now you don't have to go to that length. You can do it right here in front of your webcam and probably have the same impact. I was a film major, so I'm, I'm crazy. So you, <laughs> you notice like the that. quality. It probably drives yeah. you nuts when people whip out an iPhone and they're like all shaky right. and the lighting is bad. And I know right. I work with AV guys and oh my God, lighting is like, Holy shit, you know, like I'm telling you, when, when you see the boot camp video, you go, oh, it's like three minutes. It takes like 18 hours to shoot it, you know? 
<laughs> to put it all together and the editing and the sound. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, but you don't have to go to that length. Like, I don't want to paint the picture that you have to go to that length to do it. You don't. You just have to be out there. Our, our goal right now is to be uh, videos posted every single day on link, uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. And to keep up with those social media algorithms, you have to. And then they're on the website as well. That, that's right. where people want to be right now. They are engaged by video. Uh, excellent. Now, let me ask you this. So people are watching, they're going to, you're going to go over the scorecard process. You're going to go over your marketing in detail yep. at boot camp, right? We're going to, you're going to yep. go over that. But what, what advice, like, what did you learn? I think going through this process where I, you know, going back to 2016, I mean, I, I know from your essay that, you know, you went through, you were going through some really tough times working your ass off and just not getting anywhere, you know, and that could be, that can make anybody discouraged and want to give up. Um, so, I mean, what would you say to the person watching this who has the toolkit and is like, you know what, I, I'm struggling, I'm trying. I mean, what advice would you give them? I mean, I would say they're probably wasting a lot of time with fillers that aren't getting them anywhere. I know I certainly was. I had it in my head that more time in front of my computer was more time to push my business forward. And I, I don't think that way anymore. Now I make sure that I'm in the gym every day. I make sure that I have family time every day. I'm still just as busy as I was, but I set aside those times and I book them out of my calendar and they're non-negotiables. They, they happen every single day. I, I'm not not doing it. It's going to happen. And that's driven success in the business because I'm so regimented and I'm so disciplined about those other things that I'm doing. And I'm not missing out on my kids uh, you know, ideas or, or thoughts or their artwork or anything like that any longer. I've got more time to spend with my wife and talk to her. It's improved my relationship with her. So just, you can't just obsess about your business. You have to balance all parts of your life. And probably what happens when you do that, because it certainly happened for me, is that you're going to get better output and your partners or your employees, they all see that you're happier, you're easier to deal with and, and you get results. Very cool. All right, Ross, you're going to hang out. I see a bunch of questions popping up here. Um, if you don't mind, you can uh, hop on and answer some of those. Sure thing. Um, yeah, I mean, the, like the questions are just flooding in. So, all right. And next up, I've got Tom Glover, responsive technology partner. Some of you right, might remember him. He was a uh, finalist last year as well. He's based in Milledgeville, if I'm saying that right. Milledgeville, is that right, yeah, Tom? Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not yes. Founded in 2007, 60 employees and 8.1 million in uh, 2020. I know you're currently on a run rate for about 10.5 million this year. So um, phenomenal. Real quick, Tom, welcome. Uh, tell everyone a little bit more about your company. Yeah. So um, as you said, we were started in 2007. Uh, kind of like Ross, I didn't start to be an MSP. Uh, we were doing enterprise architecture consulting really heavily vested in the financial services sector, which grew the company from zero to almost 3 million really overnight. And then uh, end of 2008, we saw us go from 3 million to zero overnight um, as the economy tanked. So that was the point when I stopped and restarted the company and it just kind of kickstarted said, really don't want to deal with super large companies anymore. Like the small company, um, and so we started doing MSP work. And you know, since then we've grown, um, like I said we've got 60 employees now with eight locations uh, spread throughout Georgia, Virginia, North Carolina, and Florida. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started, we were really targeting accounting firms and healthcare, that was kind of my, my niche. Um, and through through the years and through uh, some of the acquisitions we've done, we've added manufacturing and um, grown a lot more into the local government space as well. Um, so that was, it's kind of, kind of cool getting to work with a lot of these different verticals and uh, have expertise in those that we can share and leverage. Okay. Very cool. Now let me go over your results. Cause these are pretty phenomenal. Your revenue is up 230%. MRR up 240,000, 
$513, uh, net profits up 696,000. And you know, one thing I wanna point out, you mentioned it in your essay. So if people read the essay, they'll, they'll learn this. But in 2018, you were only doing 600,000 in revenue. And now, you know, four or five years later, you're gonna be at 10.5. That's an enormous jump in, in revenue. I mean, you know, 79% of our industry never gets beyond the million dollar mark. And, you know, here you are. I mean, like, talk about how you did that. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I talked last year a lot about kind of that journey from the, at that point, 600,000 to 2.6 million. And you know, a huge part of it was learning how to market. You know, um, I think in my first essay, I called it the blind squirrel approach to marketing. What we were doing before, throw enough stuff out there, you know, eventually something will hit and you'll get a lead here or there. Um, but when we started focusing on a routine and, you know, regular marketing drumbeat of activity, then it's it starts to build. Um, it, you know, nothing happened overnight with it. But you got a few leads here and then you run the next campaign and you get more leads coming in. And um, in, at the end of 2018, I sold my company, um, sold it to a telco and then took over running the new organization. So through that sale, we merged my company with another company about equal size. Actually, both of us started in 2007, a lot of similarities, but then there were huge amounts of differences too. So the company I merged with, they were all break fix. Mm -hmm. um, they had very few processes in place. Uh, so that really through 2019 was a lot of our focus, aside from still doing the marketing, still hitting the regular drum beat of activity. Um, we were trying to get uh, tame the wild beast that they were, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, and slowly started converting those customers over to managed customers to MRR revenue. Still doing it. It uh, has a, It's not an overnight thing, especially when you've got customers that they had been doing a lot of the same things we were doing, um, and we were charging for it, and they weren't. Uh, so, you know, we've been pretty successful, you know, through that. Um, that kind of got us our taste for the merger and acquisition space. Um, and as I say in my essay, last year, we acquired three MSPs. Um, I, I don't recommend doing that many in a year. It has been uh, <laughs> challenging to say the least, but you know- I'm glad you can laugh about it. Cause you know, I, it's, yeah. yeah, it's either that or cry, I think, right? <laughs> That's it. And throw in rebranding the company on top of it. And uh, it's uh, lucky I have any hair left to uh, <laughs> try. It's all turned gray for sure. But um, the on top of that, though, you know, it's it, it's easy to say, oh, just, you know, grow through acquisition. That's kind of easy if you got the money to do it. We grew our core business in Georgia by one point one million dollars last year. So. Mm -hmm while we're doing the acquisitions, while we're trying to integrate these companies together, um, we were still pouring fuel to the fire. So we were still growing uh, through our marketing efforts and uh, in spite of what was going on with COVID. Yeah, I mean, I wanna say something because you know, I know some people watching this will go, oh, well, that's how he did. He grew by acquisition, you know, and they dismiss it like, well, like if you didn't do it organically, you know, you're a loser, you know? And um, so one is growing through acquisition is still a way to grow, okay? That's, so there's nothing wrong with that. Number two, acquiring companies has its own set of nightmares. You know, um, if you've ever tried to merge companies, you got culture clash, you got system and process, you've got to deal with customers and communication. I mean, it is a lot of work. And I, I know of people who've done acquisitions and have lost money, like not, not grown, but gone the other way. So it's not just like you acquire a company and all of a sudden, you know, that's the magical elixir. And if you think it is, then go out and, and acquire a company. If, it, if you think that's the easy way to growth, go do it, you know, and then you'll have a completely different perspective. So I just want to say that, but, you know, during, um, but the other thing is, you know, I watched you cause you and I talked 
more, I think, than a lot of clients because you're in the various different, like the, you know, some of the groups that were working on campaigns. And I know that you were during, you know, the shutdowns, you were very actively doing like a, a customer outreach campaign. You did strategic JV partnerships. You created resources for your community. You were doing video blogs. I mean, you were hustling too. So it, it besides the, the acquisition Talk about what are the what are the campaigns that you did that you think gave you the biggest bang for the buck last right. year and even in you know yeah. in general. So I mean that was spot on, Robin. Because one of the things, if I look back and say, what's that one big thing that we did, and that was to get out in front of COVID early. You know, we I jumped in with both feet early in March. Uh, we made over two thousand phone calls to our customers from March through May. Um, we called every customer three. We talked to every customer three times. There were a lot more phone calls to get to those conversations. Um, just in doing that, it was amazing the amount of business that we generated. You know, some of these were customers we hadn't done work for in the last 12 months, uh, but we reached out. It wasn't, what can I sell you? It was, hey, we just want to check on you. We want to make sure you're okay. Um, we got, we got these things that we're doing for all of our customers for free that you can take advantage of. Because, you know, I knew when everyone went to the work from home, we were going to see cyber, you know, really big cyber issues. So we offered for every single one of our customers to put them onto our RMM tool, give them a secure mechanism for accessing their systems. And they took us up on it. You know, and some of those customers who hadn't been doing business, now they're in our RMM it was pretty easy to convert them after the fact uh, into taking advantage of more of our services. We worked with our VoIP partner to offer free voice over IP. So we were able to roll out free soft phones to customers, get them onto the VoIP platform so that they could quickly work from home, answer their phones and, you know, still operate somewhat. Mm -hmm. The, you mentioned the JV partnership. So that was one of the huge opportunities that we found. After we took care of our, our existing customers, I went to the local chambers of commerce in every community we work with and said, hey, we want to help you. We want to give back to our community. We, we've got some webinars that we can do, you know, to kind of get the word out there, talk about some of these things. But we're also going to open up the free VoIP and the free secure remote access to any of your chamber members. So we had some, and I wouldn't say it was a huge number that jumped in and took advantage of that, but the impact to the community, the perceived impact was huge. Um, I mentioned in my essay that we were recognized by Inc. Magazine um, in one of their new uh, contests for companies who had made the biggest impact in their community. So we got a bronze level award for doing this kind of work, but the nice thing is it's paying now uh, as we went through 2020 and we're going into 2021, we're also getting a lot of new opportunities uh, from these communities that saw what we did and want to kind of be part of the team. Right. Right. So I know, again, I'm going to remind you guys at boot camp, you actually, all the templates, the campaigns, the scripts, the everything, you know, will that Tom and the other contestants use, we will be, you'll be getting those, um, you know, and I just want to underscore something you said, because when COVID hit, I, all, all I kept hearing from everybody is nobody's answering the phone. Nobody's buying anything like that. Like, and anytime I hear an absolute like this, like nobody or everybody right there, you know, it's bullshit, right? You know what I mean? It's like, you can't tell me that nobody's answering the phone. Maybe fewer are, but that doesn't mean nobody. Right. So, um, and I know you got out ahead of it and you, it, you know, you did what we told people to do is reach out to your customers. Now more than ever, you need more communication, not less. Um, and like you said, it's, it's paying off. So, um, let me ask you this. So, you know, going back, uh, you know, several years ago when, before the acquisitions and, you know, you're trying to figure out the marketing, cause you came to a rapid implementation workshop, I think. If, That's right. Right. If I'm not mistaken. Yep. I did. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, when you first started in, to now, like what were the biggest lessons that you learned? Um, a couple of things and I, I'll hit the last one that was 2020. It was really a wake up, but you, as others have said, you have to do the work. 
there are no shortcuts. You know, it's, it's about a daily routine. Um, you have to get out of your own way. You know, that was one of the biggest kind of hit right in the forehead for me early on is I was my own worst enemy because I wouldn't turn loose of anything. I, I was the only one that could do it right. I was the only one to do it the way I wanted. And there's only so many hours in the day, right? So getting back, delegating, um, starting to build that team around you of people that you can trust and then teaching them how to do the work, that right there was, I think, the biggest game changer. Um, what I saw in 2020 is that I wasn't talking to my existing customers nearly enough. You know, the, the conversation, I mean, I'm not talking about just sending them an email, but having the conversations with them, showing interest in their business and them personally, that has cemented so many relationships for us and resulted in, you know, just huge amounts of money that they've spent with us um, when the economy was so uncertain in 2020. Uh, but they trusted us. They trusted that we were there to really help them, which we were. Um, and, you know, being able to do things like somebody mentioned that there was a shortage. I mean, I mean we all saw that shortage of uh, new computers, shortage of laptops. Well, I found a vendor that I could get refurbished laptops for. And we bought, I don't even know how, probably a hundred or so uh, refurbished laptops that we purchased and put out into the hands of a lot of our uh, companies, customers that needed them. They really appreciated that. Um, just kind of thinking creatively and stepping out of the box for them. Right, right. So, you know, and um, we're going to be doing a session on QBRs or technology business reviews at boot camp. I just want to put that out there because um, you know, like you're saying, get, reaching out and having those, not just an email, not just sending a newsletter, but having a conversation with a customer more frequently, not less frequently. Um, you know, I can't underscore that enough. I mean, people just, sales doesn't happen. Like clients aren't going to call you on the phone and go, you know, Hey Tom, I got a huge pile of money over here. I don't know what to do with you. Got anything I, you could sell me? I mean, that, that doesn't happen. And so whoever's showing up and, just having discussions with the customer. I'm not even going to say selling, but just having a discussion with a customer, it just naturally leads to, um, to sales happening. What's going on? What are you struggling with? You know, because then like when they're on the phone with you, all of a sudden things pop into their head. Oh, you know what? We probably need help with this. Oh, you know, we probably need help with that. So, um, I think that's really fantastic. Um, and, 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 you know, I appreciate you uh, sharing that. So we're going to keep moving on. Um, Tom, hang out. I know you got a ton of questions about acquisitions and why'd you buy them, but we're going to have to keep moving just to, to stay on track here. So thank you, Tom. And uh, guys, keep posting your questions because I see they're, they're being answered as we go. So Neil Jern, Jern Technology, based in San Antonio, Texas. He's founded in 20, uh, 2012. He's got 15 employees. Um, and did 2.4 million in 2020. Neil, how are you, man? I'm good. Thanks for, for inviting me on. Um, yeah, we're in San Antonio. Um, 20, we just had our anniversary two days ago, nine years, nine year old company. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And All right. um, I started as just a one man IT shop, like probably a lot of people on this webinar. So um, it's been it's been an incredible experience so far. Um, we're we're expanding this year into Austin, so San Antonio is about a little over an hour south of there, and so we're making that push for the first time to go into another market. Um, our target has been construction and nonprofits primarily. Okay. We do pick up clients from like healthcare and other places too, but that's who we've been after. And I, when I was at X, uh, Rapid Implementation. I remember um, you were given a presentation on kind of going after your target market. One of the ones you put up there was construction and it seemed a little unusual, but that's exactly what we were going after. And it's been, it's been a huge growth area for us. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Construction is one of the, um, when we poll our clients and ask them what vertical it, do your best managed services clients reside in, what what business vertical, construction's right up there. Medical is is still the king, but construction's a, another big one 
for sure. So let me go over your results. So you, yeah. from one, one man band, right? Just doing it yourself. Um, you got your revenues up 1.2 million. So that is insanely good. MRR up 66,000 and net profits up uh, 32%. Um, so, I mean, like, again, I think I would put you, there's a lot of people I, that are watching that maybe they are that one man band and, you know, oh, like, you know, I don't have the time and so forth. Um, but you really started picking up steam, I think in 2019 and that, and that carried into 2020 because in, in your essay here, you know, you say in 2019, you, you hired a marketing manager, um, and hit the ground running, really got things up. I think by the end of 2019, you had an MRR growth of 47,000 that year for, or from 47,000, you grew it, uh, to 85,000. It's a 77% increase you had in 20. 19. And so you were roll, you were already kind of, you know, rolling fast when you came into 2020. Um, so tell me like what campaigns or what things did you do that helped you get ramped up so quickly? Yeah. So 2019, we was that whole year we were in accelerators and that's really the only reason I think we broke a million dollars, um, in revenue, uh, for the first time. And, and that, you know, helped us get that, you know, 77% increase in MRR. That year we did aspirin, a lot of just the same things you would learn in accelerators. And mm -hmm. we just continued that in 2020 with a little bit of added SEO, uh, more focus on referral, referrals. Um, and our biggest new client, which is really interesting, our biggest client of 2020 came through our print newsletter. <laughs> which was really interesting. Um, a client that, uh, someone that we had marketed or spoken to way back in 2018, before accelerators, before all that, um, we got to do a proposal to them in 2019 um, and they didn't pick us, they picked another MSP. Um, but uh, you know they knew about us and we just kept sending them our print newsletter every single month. And about halfway through uh, 2019, they said, Hey, this other MSP, we probably should have picked you. Um, but the thing that kept us top of mind was that print newsletter. And so in January of 2020, we closed that deal and it was, it was large, like 30, 30,000 MRR. Wow. Um, yeah. And so we kicked, we, you know, 2020 was off to a great start and then it flatlined like, like crazy, you know, <laughs> COVID right. hit and, and it was flat, but we never stopped. We just continued aspirin we got two new clients from the aspirin you know that's uh, that that's big for us um mm -hmm. and then our seo we just implemented some simple seo things very simple things to do some more online marketing we had worked with mike stadola and and your team had just said hey print you know stuff through the mail is getting delayed and there you know might, might not be as effective but we just continued it anyway and then we said let's Let's go, let's see what we can do online. And we managed to get our website traffic from about 300 visitors to about 1,700 visitors per month. Okay. So um, okay. That, that really helped. It, it, and, and we closed four new clients through website and SEO. Okay, very good. Well, I mean, the revenue is phenomenal profits. MRR, all of that. Now rolling into like when you, when you first came to accelerators, I'm just curious, did you, did you have like break fix clients and then convert them to managed or were you already, did you start managed from the beginning? I started managed um, probably about 2017 mm -hmm. and had a few break fix and actually converted one, I think with a nine word email, if I remember right. <laughs> um, okay. tried, been, I'd been telling them you got to go manage and they never did. And then at Rapid, I sent them a nine word email and they, they converted finally. But um, so yeah, we, we were mostly managed, um, but what we, we just didn't know how to do marketing at all, basically. Um, we just, you know, I, I'd say that's the big takeaway is that marketing wins. In the end, marketing wins. Cause you could be a, a worse MSP and still outgrow somebody else that's a lot better if you just if you at least do the marketing, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, you, you don't want to, I always say too, that if, if you're, if your services really truly suck, yeah. then marketing is just going to accelerate the pace at which people find out you're no good. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, 
marketing gets the new client in the door, your service keeps them right and expands it and grows it. So you, you do need both. But what I see is like, you know, cause even you, you said here in your essay, I've got to hear, you said there was a quote you saw on LinkedIn and, and it was something to the effect of, you can always tell when a small company will stay small because they obsess about the product service and neglect the business sales and marketing aspects of running a company. If you don't do it all, you stay small. And so, you know, I think what you're saying is, you know, the service, you get, the, you got to get the service where it's good. I mean, don't get me wrong, but there's a certain point where good enough is good enough and you can't then neglect the sales and marketing because, you know, just continually improving your service, which is an, it's a bottomless pit because there's always oh. something you can improve. You know, you're never growing because you're not doing the marketing. I mean, that's what you're saying, I think. Yeah. And that's exact that quote it was exactly who we were. You know, I was over there with this this technical side of the company, like a lump of coal, making it into a diamond just continuously, you know, and, and not spending any time on marketing. And so, but I had, I knew I had to make a change. And, and so making that switch to saying, we're going to do it all. And one of the keys for me was not trying to do it all by myself. Like Tom just said, was building a team. So we went in 2019, it was just me and my marketing manager, Bella, and then in 2020, we added two more marketing people to our staff, a okay. marketing assistant and, and a caller as well. So, Okay, very good. Now, yeah. what advice, like looking back, what did you learn? What advice would you give someone who's out there watching who may be where you were, you know, trying to turn their lump of coal into a diamond and only focusing inward? What advice would you give them? I would say, you know, um, get, get some help. Don't be afraid to hire someone that you're going to, raise up to be a leader in your organization so you can do this. Because my problem was trying to do it on my own. I was just never making the time to do it. And so don't be afraid to go find that person who's going to help you get it done. Just actually do it. And, mm -hmm. and that, that was huge. That was huge. You know, someone who has the passion to just, just who wants to do this as much as you do, you know, um, mm -hmm. and that, that was huge. And, with that, it just it just accelerated our growth because we could work as a team and say, you know, what are the things we have to accomplish in marketing, and let's do all of them. You know, let's 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 make sure we check every box. Really, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think also hiring a marketing person forces you to do marketing because they walk in your office and go, okay, <laughs> boss, what are we doing? Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that's part of why some people don't hire a marketing person. They, they'll say, well, I can't, you know, can I afford it? Or when's the right time? It's like, well, the right time is like when you want to grow, that's the, you yeah. know, yeah. And, and I think it's, they're, they're freaking out because they don't know what to have them do, but you know, you just, sometimes you just got to get moving in a direction and get started. So it sounds like you did. Um, and, and great job. And again, I would guys, all the, the, the details and so forth, you know, um, the, of what they did, like what Neil did, his, his campaigns, his numbers, um, you know, it's, it's all up in those essays. So I recommend you guys take a look at that. So Neil, thank you so much. Hang out. There's questions for you too. I can see, you know, people like the, the question is, uh, log is, is blowing up here. So let me move on to the, um, the fifth and, uh, like last, but not least, so to speak, uh, contestant. Um, and that's Leah Fryman. Leah is uh, the uh, found, I guess, co-founder because uh, with her husband based in uh, Spring Valley, New York, founded in 2008. She's got 14 employees. At the end of 2020, she was at 2.5 million. So Leah, welcome. Hi. Uh, a little bit about my company. I founded in 2008. Uh, just because my husband couldn't find a job and he was technical and I lost my job as a mortgage broker because the market crashed. So I just thought it was very easy to found the company. And I told him, I will hire you. You'll do the work. Um, I'll do the business part of it. Uh, and then by 2012, 2013, something like that, we were kind of maxed out with everything. Um, and then we came to your first rapid implementation and it was very eye-opening and we were like yes we got this. this this is what we need we just have got to implement this stuff um and as you know i'm i'm a go-getter so i was never that person that bought the toolkit and left it on the shelf i always no, you, you no. hustled no okay. you were yeah yeah so i 
I the first the first time I, I looked at the toolkit and I hustled through it and I did the first rapid implementation. Um, I got my first few clients from there. We switched out of break fix to MSP. Um, and then we moved up from there to MSSP now, and uh, we opened up our new cybersecurity company now in 2020. Okay. So when you started, were you, did you right out of the bat, were you an MSP or did you do break fix or what were you doing when you started? No, M uh, we did break fix. We didn't even know that MSP existed. Okay. All right. So, so I just, yeah, I just want to make sure people knew that. Now in 2020, you actually had your revenues got up to uh, 1.5 million over like almost 1.6 million MRR up 82,000 and your net profits up $1 million, which is, which is just crazy, crazy good. How, like, what are the campaigns? What did you do to generate those kinds of results? So I redid rapid in the beginning of 2020, I decided to take the year off and redo my company. I know that we say embrace the chaos, but at one point, at some point it gets to a place where you have to actually take a step back and look at your company and ask yourself if you can grow with what you have. And I couldn't. So I redid rapid, we redid our marketing, we did map 2.0. Um, and I decided to focus on building the company and kind of take a break from sales. Um, and focus on my company and focus on growing the people in the company, getting the right people, the right seat and the right bus, um, all that stuff. And that is essentially what got me to this kind of growth. So where did that revenue come from? Was that new clients? Was that existing clients? Mainly no new clients. Um, I start, first off, I have a very good relationship with my clients. I've lost like three clients in 13 years. So I, I build that relationship all my life. I think that's the most important part of it. Um, I launched in 2019, I did a cybersecurity event for business owners, no geek speak. If you want to know what cybersecurity is, the world's going nuts with security and you don't know what all these words mean. And, and you don't know if your MSP is doing a good job or not. This was going to be a no geek speak event. We had 250 people attend. It was wow. maxed out. It was a first time event, um, fully covered the cost of it. So that I hear is fantastic on its own. Um, we had sponsors, we had great companies there and it was, it, it kind of put me on the map for um, cybersecurity. That was in June of 2019. And then I launched a program called Digital Diligence, which is a very good program. You call it drip campaigning. And that's all it is. It's drip marketing, um, the newsletters. I have daily tech tip videos that go out like a good morning, 30 second video. Um, we have the online newsletters, the print newsletters. Uh, we have... Everything else, the, the blog posts, the emails, we have quizzes, and, you know, a whole program. And when somebody's not yet a hot client or, or a hot lead or anything like that, I say, can I at least add your company to our digital diligence program? It's completely free. Check it out. It'll just get your users there. So cybersecurity became something that I became very passionate about. And mm -hmm. I also positioned myself as an expert. Now, I want to put it out there that I'm not a technical person. Um, so I'm not actually an expert and I, I'm very open with telling people this is above my pay grade when they start asking me technical questions, but I do position myself in the place where I am a business person and I know as a company, what you need as a company, everybody needs something else. So I'm here for you to talk to you and, um, let's see what you need. And then I'll bring in my tech guys when necessary in the sale. So, um, cybersecurity was a big, a big thing for me. Um, I started selling security licenses, which was a big chunk of that growth. Um, and the idea was it was a la carte, choose what you want. This is what I recommend. And I, I, I upsold all my clients right away. And it came a lot from having a good relationship with them, but it also came with keeping them up, up to, it wasn't like from one minute to the next. Okay. This is cybersecurity. I have to bring you there. I started in June slowly. We did, we did the event. We did the digital diligence. I started talking about security and we constantly got there. The second part of it um, on the revenue, not the MRR, was the QBRs. I know everyone's saying it, and it sounds cliche, but um, if you're not doing QBRs, you're, you're losing your clients, you're losing, you're leaving money on the table. The QBRs has helped me with everything. It gave me a good feeling of where I am with each client. So I, I'm very settled and solid, and I know where the client is up to with me. I know if they're happy, if they're not happy, if they're not happy, what they're not happy about. So it, it gives me a good direction. And if I go to like in the last two weeks, I've been to four QBRs. 
and I go there and I see that everybody's complaining about one specific thing, I know that that thing is a real issue across the board and we have to fix it. So just taking the inside of the company and understanding um, what needs to be fixed, even that stuff, forget about the sale part that comes out of the QBRs. Um, the other thing we did because I was taking a break from sale was company accountability. Um, that was hands down one of the biggest revenue boosters in the company because I didn't realize how much projects I actually had on hand and how much my clients needed and they wanted actually to spend money, just give it to us. But my techs weren't putting in their time. Um, the clock in, clock outs weren't going as should be. It was, it was kind of a free for all. And I needed to hone in and become a, not a light boss, but a respected boss and um, really get the accountability in the company. I followed the um, seven habits of highly successful people. And I gave my team a two day course on it. And we go through the uh, different habits every week in our weekly meetings. We set up the meetings, we set up rock, big rocks, we set up all these different business pieces of it that, um, uh, uh, you know, even uh, say we have to, now that, that our, our techs are putting their time into, the, into each project, if we have to do a new project, we can now go back and say, okay, that's how much time you spent on this. Now we can quote it out. A quote used to take us about a week to figure out, okay, so how are we going to quote it? How long does it take? What do you think? What do you think? And now just tell me what that took. It's the exact same project. We're going to make some changes, tweaks, and a quote takes about an hour to make. So that was um, the cybersecurity, the QBRs, company accountability. Um, those were my three biggest boosters. Okay. So it's it, what I'm hearing, what it sounds to me like is you, and I know like you're not, it's not even doing you justice, I think, because you, you do a lot of marketing. You say like, well, I wasn't really selling in 2020, but you actually were. I mean, you were, you were just inward focused on the opportunities that you had expanding it. Right. And so is that, is that fair to say? So I mean, it's you, fair to say that that's what happened when yeah. I started this, I said, I have to fix up my company, no sales. And what happened was I was actually selling because by fixing up the company, I was selling to existing clients. I followed a lot of pumpkin plan where every client was important and I was going to nurture every client. So I, I, I learned that selling upselling is just as important as selling to new people. To new people. Right. So, so oh, I, it sounds to me that. like in 2019, especially with 250 people attending, I think everybody, if you want to give something at boot camp, I, I know this is live and it's off the cuff and you don't have to give me an answer, but if you would share with people like how you got 250 people to attend a cybersecurity web seminar, I mean, I mean, I know that they would line up to, to know how to do that because it sounds to me like you were 2018, 2019, I just know you, you were doing a lot of marketing so when 2020 kind of hit, you were like, all right, it was kind of almost the realization of I, you've built up this big momentum and you were sort of sorting through all the opportunity, tightening up the company, tightening up response times, doing the QBRs, you know, doing the projects and all of this focusing, becoming, you know, and the other thing I think it's important is, you know, you made yourself the cybersecurity expert. Like you said, you're not the tech who goes in and does the, you know, actually installs the applications and all the rest of it. But, but, you know, but you know, you know it enough what needs to be done to have that C-level executive conversation, correct? Yes. Yeah. And um, because I'm not the tech, I have, I, I don't have a technical conversation where they tune me out after five minutes. Right. It's a business conversation. So, and now that I did this to my company and I, I, grew every client to its potential. Mm -hmm. Taking on a new client is a whole new, uh, it gives it a whole new um, picture of how I'm onboarding them, what I'm offering them. There's no such a thing as getting a lower price anymore where that was always happening because now I know what I'm doing and I know what I'm, I'm, I'm offering and everything is very, very clear cut by now. Right, right. So, you know, I just want to add on, I, you know, I was been asking everybody, what'd you learn? But there's one unique question I want to ask for you because people don't might, I mean, if they read your essay, they'd know, but you know, you had um, not only, you know, you're in the epicenter of COVID, you know, you're, you're in that Northeast New York area, right? So you're like in the middle of COVID, you've got six kids, right? Is it six? I think, yep. right? You have six kids that you have to homeschool, right? And then you also had a little bout with cancer, yep. you know? I mean, so you're dealing with all of that 
while, you know, it, it, while you're growing this. Um, so I'm going to ask you a little different question than the others, which, you know, cause I've been asking everyone, what was the biggest lesson you learned? And maybe you want to answer it that way, but you know, there may be people out there that are going through some really tough times and they're trying to run a business. How did you keep it all together um, so that you could grow while dealing with all that, that hardship? It's very interesting you're asking me this question because um, I had this conversation with Rich about two weeks ago. And the answer is, and I had to figure out the answer, so I'm happy I had that conversation with him. The answer is um, staying on top and asking yourself what makes you hungry. Mm -hmm. um, I had no choice but to grow my business. I, had, I have six kids, right? I had no choice but to bring the money in. Um, when even if I had that cancer and I had surgery on a Tuesday and every Tuesday I meet a client, like two weeks later, no voice. I texted my client and said, okay, I'm going to be there on Tuesday. And it was the hunger that kept me. I, I needed that client. I need to, you know, I have a special needs daughter that because I'm in the suburbs of New York, no therapy is covered by any city programs or anything. So I have to pay for all that. And because I have to do that, I, I, I cannot say, well, you know, my daughter's just not going to get it because she has to get it. There's, there's that fight in me that's going to say, I'm going to give her what I need, what she needs, and I'm going to figure out how to do that. And whether I don't have a voice or not, it doesn't matter. The, the fact is that I need to give her that, um, that therapy. I need to give my children their schooling. I need to put bread on the table. And it's, it's kind of like, I want to say a no excuse mentality. Uh, and, and when I hire people, I say the same thing. Never give me an excuse. You can apologize for making a mistake, but never give an excuse. Excuses don't work. You have a responsibility. You know, I had those children and I, I, I have the family and I want it. It's not just that I have it. It's, I have that responsibility. I have what I want and I'm going to have to provide for them. So that gives me the push. And um, it's, it's kind of a responsibility. I don't know, maybe... So it's the hunger, I think, that um, for the, on the bottom line, it's the hunger that that always stay on top of it. If because I got to a point where I have the house, I have the pool, and I got the car and the whole nine yards, and we're doing well in business, right? My profits, a lot of it is me taking it out. So our our net profit, actually, after everything, you know, bottom line is is very high, and um, at that point, that was my conversation with Rich was okay, now I need to kind of reinvent myself because I have everything that I basically need, all the necessities. And he said, so now what makes you hungry? And then I said, okay, now I got to find that new thing that's going to make me hungry, that new thing that's going to push me out there and get there. And I found it and I, and I got out there and I started selling again. I got three new clients just in the last two weeks and things are moving along um, because I found that new hunger that I needed. So I think constantly looking for excuses kind of, of what makes you hungry and what keeps you push, keeps right. pushing you and just going with it. Yeah. Well, I, you know, and it's a, it's a, you know, again, nobody would, nobody would fault you if you said, Hey, you know what? I, I got so much going on. You know, if the business had, had gone backwards or you didn't grow, you know, no one would look at your situation and go, Oh man, you're just making excuses. I mean, dealing with your kids being homeschooled, special needs, all these things, you know, COVID and you're like in New York, uh, like Ross is in that sort of that, the, the, I guess the epicenter of it all, where it all really kind of went down bad. Um, but, uh, and I think that's a, that's a good way to end to even talk about this. Cause all, everybody, all five of you guys that are, um, that are in this competition, I mean, you really do have to want more. You, you got to hate being average. You got to hate mediocrity and you got to have drive because it is hard growing a business. I mean, anyone who says it's, I mean, that's why, you know, very few actually ever, you know, there's not many entrepreneurs in the world period, you know, we're, we're a minority of just business owners. Um, and then when you, when you add on like who's actually successful in business, it's an even smaller percentage um, you know, you got to really want it. You got to have drive. You got to have ambition. You can't talk ambition. And then, you know, because, you know, I have my, my mug here. It's like, you know, don't let your a game be average, you know, but you know, it's, it's like the other mug I've got. If, if, if it's important, you'll find a way. If it's not, you'll find an excuse. So, um, appreciate that very much. All right. So guys, just for time here, um, Ryan, in a minute, I, I know there were a ton of questions I'm looking, I think there was over 50 questions that were, that came in. 
Um, and so I'll ask you, Ryan, if there's one or two questions you really feel it would be, or like maybe one question would be important to ask the whole group. Um, but again, just to remind you all, um, these five finalists are going to be on stage at our event this year, robinsbigseminar.com. Um, and you can download their essays um, at robinsbigseminar.com forward slash BYB and their stories and their numbers and how they got there and the campaigns they used are there. If you have the toolkit, you'll have most of these campaigns. Now you won't have their version of it. You know, everybody always like customizes it a bit to themselves. And so that's why I would encourage you to come to boot camp this year. Um, it's going to be in May. It's in Orlando. Um, you know, the vaccines are, 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 are getting distributed and our, our sincere hope is by the time uh, end of April rolls around, pretty much everybody who wants a vaccine is going to have it. And Florida is open. More states are opening. Um, and so, uh, but if, the, if you don't feel safe traveling, we also have a virtual option so you can watch virtually. It's nowhere near the same as being in person. I'm telling you, you're going to get so much more value if you're there in person. Um, and, uh, you know, these five people are there. And by the way, there were, you know, we had a lot of entries. These are the top five. We have, I mean, there are a lot of our members that are succeeding, that are growing, um, and, uh, you know, you get to hang out with those people and that's really important. So hopefully I stalled long enough for Ryan to come up with a question. That's what I was really doing. I was trying to, cause I didn't, we didn't have that conversation before he started. I was like, oh shit, I'm about to ask him to look for a question. Ryan. You're good. Yeah. You know, I actually, um, I've had people asking me, you mentioned it a bit about boot camp, and, you know, there, you, you addressed it already, but I'd like to get from the, the finalist perspective. You know, the, the opportunity to be in person or virtual, I'm curious what you guys would say for those that are sitting there going like, oh, you know, it's a lot of time away from my business. I've got family obligations, especially, you know, Leia, with you talking through that, like, should I make the commitment to attend in person or is virtual going to be good enough? What, what's your take on that, guys? And I guess we can kind of just run through Mike if you want to start and we'll go down the order if you want. Yeah, so I would say 100% be in person if you can afford it and, you know, and everything else it is. You leave much more charged up, you're much more amped up. And another kind of lesson through all this stuff is the best way to work on your business is to not be in your business. Like, you know, I mean, it's if you're sitting at your desk watching it, somebody's knocking on your door. And it doesn't matter if you put a do not disturb sign or whatever else, you will be bothered more and you will do much better if you show up at boot camp, put your phone on, you know, do not disturb or silent or just shut it off and leave it in the room, go check it at lunch or something. You'll get way more out of it and you'll come out of it a lot better off. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, Ross, let's do Ross next. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll attach, I'll, I'll, you know, right at the end of what Mike said, it's electric being there. It's not only are the sessions fantastic and, and you're learning a ton of stuff, but the people that you meet and their willingness to open up and share ideas and, and compare, there is no better way to know how well you're doing and, and what's going on than to work with a group of your peers. So you've got a whole ton of people that are there that do exactly what you do. Some of them might be further along than you. Some of them might be behind you. The point is you get to go there and be with them for several days. So it's just something you don't want to miss out on. Yeah. I, you know, I, I want, and I just let me little tip for all of you. Whenever I go to an event, I always have in my mind, what are three questions or four or five, you know, few questions I really want to get the answer to it. It helps me focus. And so everybody I meet with, I'm like, Hey, you know, what are you doing for comping your salespeople or whatever, you know, whatever the question is, um, those hallway conversations at lunch at breakfast at the, the networking, you know, you get to talk to your vendors. You guys, I know you don't like talking to vendors always when they call you nonstop, but sometimes it's worthwhile because they can tell you new things that are happening, new products, new revenue streams. They're always given discounts, wink, wink, nod, nod, you know? So if you're going to go shopping, the best time to shop is at boot camp, you know, because everybody's given boot camp discounts. Um, so that's, that's really important too. Um, all right. So anyway, I, I jumped in there. All right, Tom, go ahead. You, you're next. Um, you know, kind of piggybacking on what they said, the energy at boot camp is absolutely unbelievable. You know, for me, 2019 was the first year I went. And I can say that was the kick in the butt that really got me excited and got me driving forward. Um, being able to watch the Better Your Best competition in person. You know, I mean, uh, last year was definitely weird, uh, especially for the contestants themselves, talking <laughs> to a big camera in front of your face. Um, but 
the energy just wasn't there with that. Either. Yeah. You know, and I, the, my employees that attended it, they kind of all had the same thing. And it was great to be able to have it, but being there in person, feeling the excitement, um, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. All right. Neil. Yeah. So I, I was like Tom, I, my first one was 2019 and I, so I've been to one in person and one virtual and I have to say in person all the way. And mainly, you know, it's just way too easy to get distracted when you're sitting in front of your computer, people are interrupting you. When you're there, you're in, you're engaged much better in person in my, my, my view. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. And Leah. So aside for the energy that's obvious in the room, um, I want to go back to the hunger that I said. People said they can't afford it. It's expensive. The hotel, the, the flight, right? Um, when I started with Rapid the first time, I actually borrowed the money for everything to pay for the toolkit, to take, pay for the um, flight and the hotel and all that stuff. And that's where the stepping out of your comfort zone a little bit and staying hungry. I was like, I have to win that because I have to get back my money because otherwise how was how I going to repay that, right? That was my kind of way of staying hungry. So if you can't afford it, there is a beautiful return on your investment because what you're going to get from the people, just talking to the people, forget about the speeches, talking to the people around. It's the nicest group of people. I have to say like people are asking me, these are all your competitions. I'm like, oh, right. They're my competitions, right. But they're not because there's everyone's just very willing to share, very open to share. And when you asked me before to share my ITCON 2019, I was like, yes, I'm so excited. Let me go get that arranged and get that out there. And I want to prepare this for you. I'm so excited to share this with people because it's just a great, you, you really have a great group of people and you can't do that virtually. You can't, you can't meet people virtually. No, it's not the same. You know, we try to do networking virtually and all that. It just, it sucks, you know, and um you know, and I, and you're right. I'm glad you mentioned that about the community because, you know, I, like even when I talked to you, the finalists, and I said this to Ryan, I'm sure he communicated it to you. It's like, you know, I, I don't want, you know, when, when you're up on stage, yes, you're trying to win a car. Yes, you're, you're, you're gunning to be spokesperson for me. But what I don't want is like, you know, really don't make it a, don't make it about me personally. I'm like, you know, talk about this community that we've built and talk about the results that you've gotten, how you've transformed and, and give people the, the tools, the templates, the steps, the strategies, you know, people want that kind of meat. And I know you guys are going to bring that and deliver it to them. Um, but the community that I've built, I think is the thing, uh, the single most thing I'm most proud of. Um, it is a very generous community. It is one of giving and openness and sharing. And, um, you know, that, that, that was our mission statement from the beginning is to build that, that community of success minded entrepreneurs. And, um, and I think we've achieved that. And again, I think you really can't experience it till you come to boot camp and, you know, just even to, to brag on it, the community more. Um, I have people who are, not my competition, they're like my peers. So they do sort of what we do, but they do it for attorneys or they do it for realtors or uh, dentists or whatever. And, you know, boot camp is like a mecca for a lot of them because they, they always come to me and say, Hey, I want to, can I come to your event? Do you mind if I come to your event? Can I hang out with, you know, can I see, like, can I be a judge? Cause some, we ask for, you know, them to help out with judging and whatnot. And, you know, it's, it's just, they, they say it all the time. They're like, it's like a family reunion of people that actually like each other, not a weird family, but a family that actually gets along. So yeah, I would encourage all of you guys to, to come to boot camp. Um, one of the things I will tell you all, I know there was a lot of questions. I will make sure all of the, the finalists get these questions. That'll help them craft their session at boot camp a little bit more. So when they're on stage, they can share more of the, you know, that, those answers with you. Um, and we'll also make sure that whether it's me writing a through a blog or something, we will get your questions answered. We're just, unfortunately, we're right up against the time here. Um, and we could go on for like with all these questions a lot more. So, uh, Ryan, I don't know, I'll turn it back to you. I think we're good. So, um, first off, thank you. I mean, obviously thank you, Robin, for, for hosting and, and running this for everybody. Thank you to the five finalists. We're thrilled to have you guys and i um, really excited for Orlando and seeing you all take the stage and share with our community. So um, we will see you guys on a future uh, marketing deep dive call or a how-to call. We actually have one of our finalists, Leah, 
on our how-to call in two weeks going over her cybersecurity campaign. So join us then and um, we'll see everybody soon. Take care, all right, everyone. Thank you all. All right, thanks everybody. Great job. See you guys. See ya.